Uh, he's not here yet, so. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Epigenomics of Common, Rare, and Semantic Variants Underlying Disease and Cancer. I am Bob Woodard of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problems to the green Q&A button at the lower left. Now I would like to introduce today's speaker, Manolis Kellis. Dr. Kellis is a professor of computer science at MIT, where he directs the MIT Computational Biolo Biology Group. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kellis. I will now turn the presentation over to him. So thank you all for coming. I hope you can hear me well. Um, what I'd like to tell you about is
All right, can you hear me now? <laughs> uh, could you hear anything that I said until now? Okay, so maybe I'll start to talk again. I'm really sorry. Um, okay, so just to summarize very briefly my introduction, I will talk about how epigenomics can in fact allow us to understand common, rare, and somatic variants that underlie disease and cancer. The promise of GWAS is to reveal new mechanisms, target genes, therapeutics, and to enable personalized medicine, but the challenge is that there's a large number of variants in the same linkage to equilibrium block, making it impossible to discover which of the many SNPs are in fact causal. Moreover, most of the variants are non-coding, and the cell type of action is not known, and the mechanism is not known. So the remedy for this is to actually provide a systematic annotation of the non-coding genome that allows us to link enhancers to their regulators and to their target genes, and to develop new methods for utilizing them in order to be able to predict disease-relevant cell types, target genes, genetic variants, upstream regulators, the relevant pathways, and the cellular phenotypes. So what I'll talk about in uh, this particular presentation is, number one, how do we build a reference map of the regulatory genome that allows us to distinguish near uh, um, the regulatory elements that are near the beginning of the gene, known as promoters, that I'll color in red, distal regulatory elements, uh, known as enhancers, that I'll color in orange, and then transcribed regions, repressed regions, that I'll color in um, green and gray, in order to understand systematically the regions of associations, the cell types in which they're acting, the genes that they target, the nucleotides that are underlying disease, and the regulators. And uh, I'll focus on three different applications in the second part of the talk. Number one, understanding top scoring GWAS hits. Number two, understanding weakly associated variants that do not mean genome-wide significance and uh, catching some of the hidden heritability of the uh, uh, genetic association studies, and number three, understanding cancer mutations that uh, underlie somatic variants that arise and can lead to cancer. So here's the three parts of the talk. So first, I'm going to talk about characterizing the genomic landscape, and then these three uh, applications of GWAS, weakly associated variants, and um, somatic variants. So what is this epigenomic roadmap that I spoke about earlier? Uh, it's a map that allows us to now cat Sure, systematically, the epigenomic landscape of a large number of primary tissues and cells from adult samples, embryonic samples, as well as uh, immortalized cell lines and cell lines that are differentiated from them, as well as primary cells in a large number of tissues. And in each of those, we map a diversity of epigenomic assays that allow us to characterize the different uh, types of regions that I mentioned earlier. So using the same color code, promoter regions have very specific marks, enhancer regions have a different set of marks, transcribed regions have a different set of marks. So what are these marks? These marks are chemical modifications that happen on the histone proteins that DNA is wrapped around, but also the accessibility of DNA and modifications that happen directly on, on the CPG dinucleotides of the genome, known as uh, methylation marks. So we have systematically mapped a large number of these histone modifications, open chromatin, as well as DNA methylation, and the output of all of these processes based on gene expression by RNA-seq in more than 100 different cell types. So the resulting data matrix looks something like this, where there's 127 different epigenomes, and for each of those, we have a large number of chromatin marks. You can see here that those five marks that I described earlier are mapped on every epigenome, and then a large number of additional marks are mapped in a subset of epigenomes. What does that allow us to do? That allows us to now look at an individual cell type and look at the large diversity of histone modification marks, as well as DNA methylation, RNA expression, that are uh, mapped in each of those. And this is a screenshot from the Watch Your Browser. And we can summarize all of that information in a single annotation for each cell type that allows us to distinguish enhancer regions, repressed regions, transcribed regions, based on the combinations of these histone modification marks, as I mentioned earlier. So 
how do we do that? We basically learn a model for the specific combination of marks based on a hidden Markov model that allows us to go through the genome and discover a set of chromatin states that allows to summarize combinations of these histone modification marks. And these chromatin states cover a very diverse uh, fraction of the genome. There are some states that cover about 70% of every cell type, and these are quiescent states where you don't see any of these marks. And then there's regulatory states uh, that are associated with promoters, enhancers, that cover a total of less than 5% of each genome, and yet these are the regions that are most strongly conserved across different species, enabling us to now start predicting uh, important regions, if you wish, in each of the cell types where the regulatory activity primarily happens. So we can use this to define chromosomal domains using the expression of these chromatin states. For example, you can see here that about half the genome is in fact inactive in the vast majority of cell types, but in fact the other half is very, very strongly active and these regions that were discovered primarily based on these chromatin states, actually exclusively based on these chromatin states, are in fact showing very different gene density, very different associations with these uh, nuclear envelope uh, marked by lamina regions, and they're also associated with different chromosomal bands, suggesting that in fact these are domains uh, of the chromosome that are in fact distinct in their function. So I focused until now on characterizing the epigenomic landscape, and now I'm going to switch to using the differences between cell types in order to reveal patterns of activity, modules of co-regulated elements, and networks that link genes together to their enhancer regions and their re upstream regulators. So we can now take one of these marks, H3K4ME1, which is associated with enhancer regions, and actually build a phylogeny of all of the different cell types. And I've color-coded the cell types according to their biology. For example, you can see that immune cells are in fact all clustering together, and you can distinguish T cells from B cells. You can also see that brain samples are all clustering together. You can see that induced pluripotent cells are clustering together, as well as embryonic stem cells. And you can also see, for example, that fetal brain here groups with the embryonic stem cells rather than with the adult brain. You can see uh, that uh, this clustering, in fact, captures a lot of the common biology of uh, immune, brain, muscle, heart, smooth muscle, and fetal tissues. We can also visualize the uh, most extreme um, cell types and samples using this multidimensional scaling approach that allows us to basically show that immune cells and embryonic stem cells are, in fact, the most extreme. Uh, followed by brain versus skin or fat, followed by muscle. And some of the uh, chromatin state coverage of these cell types, in fact, allows us to understand why they're so extreme and what makes them so different. For example, embryonic stem cells show a large enrichment in these bivalent chromatin states that are poised for either activation or repression. And you can see here that T cells and B cells are, for example, depleted in promoter regions. You can now exploit that information to start understanding how the epigenomic landscape, in fact, varies across these 127 epigenomes. So in a previous slide, I showed you one of these annotations all the way up here for IMR90. But in fact, you can see that by having these annotations across all 127 different cell types that have been mapped by, mapped by Roadmap Epigenomics and ENCODE, you can actually see the dynamics of different genes in different regions. You can see that some genes are consistently active across different regions. You see that other genes are coming on and off across different regions. And you can see that other genes are primarily repressed and only turn on in very specific cell types. The other thing you can see is how different promoter regions are from enhancer regions in their activity patterns across cell types. So these red marks that are associated with promoter function are in fact very stable. You can see these red columns, uh, you know, whether the gene is expressed or not, the promoters remain on. But when you look at enhancer regions, these orange marks, you can see that they are in fact much more dynamic and they're, they're in fact enabling us to now perhaps learn modules of coordinated activity across these enhancer regions. 
So we're going to take all these enhancer regions that are in orange and cluster them together across the entire genome. And we get a picture like this. So we have now 223 million enhancer elements that are associated with DNA's accessibility. And we can cluster them into a small number of activity patterns. In this particular case, we've chosen 226 activity patterns. And what you can see here are the vertical bars that are separating the different patterns from each other. And every single one of these 2.3 million enhancers laid side by side. And the first thing you'll notice is that there's a very small number of these enhancer regions that are ubiquitously active. But the vast majority are, in fact, showing tissue-specific or uh, lineage-specific function. And if you look at the genes associated with them, you actually see that they're enriched in uh, functions that make a lot of sense according to the tissues in which those enhancers are expressed. For example, if I trace here the um, T cell activity and the enhancers that are active in T cells, what you can see is that they're very strongly enriched in immune functions. And you can also see that uh, enhancers that are active in the brain are in fact enriched in learning and memory functions, which makes a lot of sense and also suggests that these enhancer modules are in fact enriched in co-regulated uh, uh, genes. And in order to, under to uncover that, we basically looked at a set of regulatory motifs that are previously characterized across the genome, and we searched for where do they occur in each of these modules. So we basically took these modules of activity across these 127 cell types, and for each one of these modules, we basically asked, what are the regulatory motifs that are enriched in that module? And if I look at the expression patterns of the corresponding regulator, for example, SPI1, is the expression of that regulator correlated or anti-correlated with the activity of the corresponding enhancers? And for SPI1, we find a positive correlation enabling us to predict that it is an activator rather than a repressor. And for REST2, for example, we find a negative correlation suggesting, in fact, that it is a repressor consistent with its known function of repressing brain uh, enhancers in non-brain tissues. So that allows us to now predict a systematic catalog of these regulators for each of these modules, which we can visualize in a simple way as a network of, uh, that, that links together each of these regulators to the corresponding cell types that make up the activity of these modules. And you can see here, for example, that SPI1 is predicted to regulate a lot of these uh, B cells, and indeed it is a known regulator of immune cells. You can see here that GATA is associated with erythropoiesis, and you can see that this uh, muscle uh, factor is in fact associated with both muscle and heart, again, according to the known biology. You can also see that RFX4 is in fact associated with several regions of the brain, uh, and in, indeed, it has been known to play various uh, brain functions, although this is less recognized than some of the other regulators. So we can also start linking enhancers not just to their upstream regulators that control them, but also to the downstream genes that they control. And to do that, we did a similar clustering, uh, similar as we had done previously for the enhancer regions that I showed in a previous slide, but we now clustered the gene expression patterns of each of the corresponding genes and we were able to then link modules of enhancers to modules of genes. And that allows us to now have a much more robust linking between individual enhancers and individual genes through the modules that connect them both, which are um, uh, much more robust because there's a much smaller number of modules that are actually being linked. We uh, validated these links based on uh, physical uh, connections from chromatin conformation capture across the whole genome, known as Hi-C, as well as protein-centered interactions uh, using chia pet, and also genetic links predicted from expression quantitative trait loci. And in each case, we found that the uh, activity-based links are very good predictors of each of these physical interactions or genetic interactions giving credence to our method, even though they observe very different types of evidence, they seem to actually predict the same set of links. 
So we have used epigenomics to characterize the regulatory elements active in each of a large number of cell types and to understand the epigenomic differences between cell types to find extreme cells, uh, for example, that show very different activity patterns. But we've also ex exploited these activity patterns to recognize modules of co-regulated genes uh, and co-regulated enhancers to link these modules into networks that actually predict both the upstream regulators of each of these enhancers as well as their downstream target genes. So now, let's see how we can use that to identify disease-relevant tissues and regulators. So we built a simple model that basically says that enhancers that are targeted by the same regulators are more likely to be associated with the same genetic condition as evidenced by the single nucleotide polymorphisms that are associated with that condition. But there is ambiguity because every SNP is in fact associated with a large number of partners, some of which might lie in the same enhancer region, but some of which are lying in different enhancer regions. And this ambiguity here can be resolved using this iterative learning approach that allows us to both predict the relevant regulators for each of the traits, as well as the most likely causal SNPs for each of these traits by systematically predicting one using the other and iterating. So the input to this model is a set of genome-wide association p-values. The regulatory network that links each of these regulators to the corresponding enhancer regions and uh, these enhancer regions to the corresponding genes, um, as well as the genetic network linking each of the SNPs to all of the regions that that SNP might disrupt, either directly or indirectly, through its linkage disequilibrium uh, partners. So the output of that model is a set of trade relevant transcription factors, a set of causal SNPs, and a set of target genes. So Here's a very simple example of multiple regulators targeting the same enhancer, but each of these regulators targets a lot of other loci across the genome, enabling us to predict which of these regulators is the most relevant for the specific trait. Each of these regulators is linked to one or more SNPs, and they are also linked to one or more enhancers, enabling us to now run our iterative procedure and predict both the set of target genes and the set of regulators associated with each trait, as well as the specific SNPs that are more likely to be causal. So here's an overview of the cell types that are, in fact, the most enriched for each of these loci. So this is looking very directly at a set of genome-wide association studies. So there are 53 different traits here, uh, including height, allergy, um, platelet volume, uh, cardiac traits such as the PR, repolarization interval, or uh, blood pressure, as well as cholesterol traits and um, inflammatory bowel disease, as well as Alzheimer's. And now we can ask for each of those traits, which enhancers are the most enriched? We basically take all of the SNPs, all of the single nucleotide polymorphisms across the whole genome for each of these traits, and then we ask, do these genetic variants tend to preferentially lie in regions that are active in specific cell types? And that allows us to now find almost a diagonal, basically telling us that different diseases are in fact enriched in different cell types. And you can see, in fact, a lot of concordance between immune traits that I mentioned earlier and immune enhancers that are active in T cells or B cells you can find that, for example, blood pressure is only enriched in one cell type, namely the left ventricle. And you can see uh, some surprising uh, findings. For example, inflammatory bowel disease has both an immune component and a digestive component, suggesting that this regulation of both types of tissues, in fact, is associated with uh, inflammatory bowel disease. And you can see here that Alzheimer's disease is not associated with brain at all. It is, in fact, instead associated with immune cells and uh, monocytes that are um, uh, marked by CD14. And this is, in fact, a very interesting story because we have independent validation of that very unusual association whereby mice that are undergoing neurodegeneration based on 
Alzheimer's-like symptoms induced by the P50, P25 uh, protein in their brains are undergoing two types of changes. Number one, they're undergoing immune changes and activation of immune components. And number two, they're undergoing neuronal changes and deactivation of neuronal components. And you can see these changes at the expression level, at the promoter level, and at the enhancer level. And when you look at human, you see that the same categories of genes are in fact enriched in human patients based on expression profiling of brains of human uh, uh, patients of AD and uh, human controls. You can also see that specific immune regulators and neuronal regulators are enriched in the corresponding activated and repressed components associated with Alzheimer's disease progression. But what's really striking is that the enrichment in disease-associated variants for these studies is happening primarily in immune cells, and in fact, you see a depletion in these uh, fetal brain samples. What this is suggesting is that, in fact, immune cell dysregulation is a causal component of Alzheimer's disease, and this might be due to the microglial cells which are resident immune cells of the adult brain, or the macrophages that infiltrate brain in neurodegeneration. So we've all known that um, inflammation is in fact associated with Alzheimer's disease, but this study suggests that inflammation might actually be a causal component that leads to AD rather than um, simply a consequence of the neurodegeneration. So this story is in fact highlighting this particular link between Alzheimer's disease and monocytes and immune cells rather than uh, the brain as we would have expected, perhaps uh, based on prior knowledge. And it also highlights um, this much more general association of immune traits with either T cells or B cells with, um, you know, the heart repolarization interval and blood pressure, as I mentioned in, uh, earlier, specifically with the heart and um, cholesterol, specifically with liver. So it allows us to now associate each of these different diseases with uh, very different tissues that might underlie them. That allows us to now go and study specifically these tissues when try to uncover the mechanistic basis of each of these diseases. So we've made all of these data publicly available. All of these predictions can be found through Haploreg. Uh, this um, tool for browsing the regulatory landscape of haplotypes associated with disease. So you can enter any SNP or any GWAS study, and it will basically tell you what are all of the uh, promoter elements, enhancer elements, uh, you know, regulators and regulatory motifs that are associated with uh, each of these regions, and uh, you can uh, try it out here. So let's now dive into uh, mechanistically dissecting these disease-associated loci and using this new characterization of the epigenomic landscape to systematically understand uh, human disease. So uh, I'm going to now switch to the second part of the talk about the three applications, and I'm going to first talk about genome-wide association uh, studies and the most significant hits and how we can interpret them and gain new insights into human disease, and then I'm going to talk about how um, we can use that to actually start looking at weakly associated regions and somatic variants associated with cancer. So what are the goals in dissecting non-coding associations? As I mentioned earlier, what we need to understand first is given a region of association that spans many genetic variants, what is the relevant tissue and cell type in which this is acting? Number two, we'd like to know for these non-coding regions, who are the target genes that are actually being targeted by these regions? And these target genes, as I'm going to show in this part of the talk, can sit more than one million nucleotides away. Number three, we want to understand who are the causal nucleotides that are responsible for these associations and fine map these regions in order to then understand the dysregulatory event for the upstream regulators that are targeting these causal nucleotides. And then lastly, we need to understand the cellular phenotypes and the organismal phenotypes that arise from these, these regulatory events. And this sounds very daunting, but the tools that I mentioned earlier, combined with directed experimentation 
in the relevant cell types that we can predict using these approaches uh, and disruption of the specific regulators and the specific nucleotides and the specific target genes that are predicted by these approaches can in fact allow us to dissect these. And in this talk, I'll, I'll focus on the work by Melina Klausnitzer applying these tools to the FTO locus. So what is the FTO locus? It is the strongest association with obesity. It actually spans 47,000 nucleotides in chromosome 16, and it, they sit exactly in the first intron of the FTO gene. The challenge, however, is there's a very large number of genetic variants that are all associated with the phenotype of obesity, cardiovascular traits, and type 2 diabetes, but we don't really know which one is the causal one, and the very large span of this region makes it very difficult to understand the phenotype. There are no protein-altering variants in this region, leading many to suggest that it might play a, a regulatory role, but the target gene, as well as the relevant cell type, is actually not known. So we set out to uncover these using a systematic study. So there's been a large number of conflicting proposals. Some people propose that FTO itself is a target. Some people propose that it is IRX3 acting in pancreas. Others have proposed that it is IRX3 acting in the brain. Others have proposed that it's another gene acting in the brain or it's another gene acting in lymphocytes, leading to a large number of answers and uh, all conflicting with each other. So we basically decided to take an unbiased approach and basically look at these epigenomic annotation maps to predict the relevant tissue and cell type. And we looked at these maps across 127 epigenomes that I mentioned earlier, specifically for the FTO locus. And what we found is that these maps light up specifically in mesenchymal preadipocytes. So these are the stem cells that actually give rise to both the adipose lineage and uh, other lineages. And these are the cells specifically that give rise to both white adipocytes and br br bright or beige adipocytes. And these enhancers are much longer in these regions than for any other locus. So to understand if the genetic variant associated with FTO, with obesity in the FTO locus, is in fact changing the expression of that enhancer, we carried out enhancer assays for both the non-risk and the risk uh, haplotype in 10KB segments. And what we found is pretty striking. Validating our prediction that adipocytes are in fact uh, relevant, we found a very strong increase in enhancer activity specifically for the risk haplotype, but not for the non-risk haplotype, suggesting in fact that the genetic variant associated with the disease is leading to gain of regulatory activity in this particular region. Uh, and we validated that this is specific to adipocytes and not found in neuronal cells, muscle cells, or any other cell type. So the next thing we did is, in fact, um, ask whether uh, this is, in fact, changing the expression of target genes in this locus. So to predict target genes, we basically looked at the topological domain that is associated with this FTO uh, genetic variant, and it actually spans 2.5 megabases of interactions both upstream of this variant and downstream of this variant, giving us a total of eight candidate genes. And to basically look for genotype-dependent expression levels, we gathered a cohort of 20 homozygous risk and 18 homozygous non-risk individuals, and for each of them, we gathered adipose samples and differentiated pre-adipocytes for each of these samples. And what we found was pretty striking. There are exactly two genes among these eight candidates that show differential expression, and this is very significant. And these genes are sitting strikingly far, 500 KB and 1.1 megabases away from the specific FTO locus. So this suggests that these are the only two targets that are speci specifically differentially expressed between risk and non-risk individuals in preadipocytes. And again, these show increased expression for the risk allele consistent with the enhancer change of activity. We next turn to predict the causal nucleotide variant. And for this, we use two approaches. The first approach is actually regulatory motif enrichment across BMI hits across the whole genome, and the second 
is an approach previously published by Melina Klausnitzer, who actually led this study, that actually looked at regulatory motif combinations that are evolutionarily conserved across mammals. And the two approaches agreed that this particular region of uh, this FTO locus in the first 10 kb interval is in fact the most likely to be causal as it has the highest score and the highest concentration of enriched regulatory motifs. And the specific risk variant alters a T to a C, abolishing this AT rich motif that overlaps this particular region. So indeed we found that making that single nucleotide alteration changed the activity of these enhancers and was able to lead to higher activity in the non-risk individuals by introducing this single nucleotide change. We use that to now start looking at the upstream regulators that might actually be targeting this predicted causal nucleotide. And we found that there are three candidates, the ARID family of regulators and two additional regulators that have similar motifs that overlap this locus. Among them, the most enriched is by far the ARID 5B regulator that is the most expressed in both whole adipose tissue from both lean and obese individuals and in isolated adipocytes from both risk and non-risk individuals. So the model is the following, that the ARID 5B repressor would normally bind the DNA motif, which is AT rich, and repress enhancer activity thereby shutting off both IRX3 and IRX5. But in the risk individuals, the motif would be lost, leading to lack of repression and therefore gain of expression for both IRX3 and IRX5. And that's exactly what we found. We found that in order to successfully repress the enhancer, you need to have the intact motif and you need to have the intact regulator. But if you disrupt either of the two, you basically get a gain of enhancer activity. Similarly, to repress IRX3 or IRX5, you need, again, the intact motif and regulator, but de-repressing, uh, I mean, disrupting either of the two, in fact, leads to a gain of activity. So that suggests that repression of the enhancer is, in fact, the causal mechanism that's leading to this dysregulation of IRX3 and IRX5 that might underlie the FTO association with obesity. So we have uncovered the regulatory circuitry of the FTO genetic association with obesity, but we don't know yet how does this circuitry actually lead to obesity. And in order to do that, we need to understand the cellular and the organismal phenotypes that are affected. To do this, we basically carried out a co-expression analysis across a large number of individuals to look for genes that are positively and negatively correlated with RX3 and RX5. And we found a large number of genes that in fact cluster in a small number of pathways. The genes that are most negatively correlated are associated with mitochondrial function, and the genes that are the most positively correlated are associated with lipid metabolism. And indeed, these changes in gene expression are reflected in the cellular phenotypic differences between risk and non-risk individuals. We find that the risk individuals have much lower DNA content for the mitochondria, suggesting the reduced mitochondrial number, and they also have a higher size of adipocytes, suggesting accumulation of lipids. So the model is that the risk allele is in fact leading to a shift from energy dissipation to energy storage. And in particular, we find that in risk individuals, the uncoupling protein 1, UCP1, that depolarizes the mitochondrial membrane, leading to import of protons and uh, loss of energy through heat, is in fact much lower for the risk allele individuals than for the protective allele individuals, and that the protective allele individuals are in fact able to respond to either cold stimulus or brain stimuli associated with uh, generation of heat and increase the expression of that gene, thereby increasing thermogenesis. Uh, but this response is actually lost in the risk allele patients. So the model is very simple. It basically says that the RH5B repressor is in fact uh, no longer able to repress the corresponding enhancer in pre adipocytes leading to an increase in RX3 and RX5 expression and shutting off thermogenesis and turning on uh, fat storage. And we carried out a series of experiments that, are, that I'll go through briefly to actually validate that model.
including knockdown of IRX3 and RX5, which according to our model should lead to anti-obesity phenotypes, overexpression of IRX3 and RX5, which should lead to pro-obesity phenotypes, as well as perturbations of the regulatory motif itself and of the upstream regulator. So I'll, I'll go through them rather quickly to basically say that indeed in RX3, uh, an, an IRX3 repression has a specific gain of thermogenesis in risk individuals leading to non-risk levels and the corresponding overexpression of RX3 leads to loss of thermogenesis specifically in the protective allele individuals matching uh, risk allele levels, indeed showing that IRX3 and RX5 are causal. In mouse, downregulation of IRX3 has very strong anti-obesity phenotypes, which are much stronger than the same repression in brain, indicating that this uh, variant is acting and these genes are acting primarily in adipocytes. And these mice lose the ability to gain weight, even in a high-fat diet. We also find that uh, these mice are in fact showing increased energy expenditure both at night and during the day when they're sleeping, suggesting that this is not due to increased activity and this is not due to reduced fat, uh, food intake. Knocking down the regulator has again pro-obesity phenotypes exactly as the model would expect and these are happening specifically in the protective allele individuals. We're finding that uh, the corresponding changes of the regulatory uh, variant using genome editing in vivo are in fact able to reverse the phenotypic signatures of obesity in the risk individuals or in fact lead to the pro-obesity signatures in non-risk individuals. So uh, we've in fact edited this allele in a bi-directional way starting with non-risk individuals and then editing the allele to a C and then uh, showing that that leads to gain of RX3 expression, and then editing that edited allele back to a T and showing that represses both RX3 and RX5. We've also taken the specific nucleotide variant from the risk individuals and shown that by editing it, we're in fact able to reverse the gene expression specifically when RX5B is expressed, but not when RX5B is knocked down, again showing causality at the nucleotide level. The last thing we found is that this variant is acting specifically in early adipocyte differentiation for both RX3 and RX5, but that the difference in expression goes away by day four or six of differentiation. So what that suggests is that, um, and in fact, the last thing we did, in fact, showed that the, ther the thermogenesis signature in these risk individuals can be completely rescued by editing that single nucleotide variant. So that, in fact, establishes causality of that single nucleotide variant in, in fact, driving the cellular signatures of obesity. So the model is very simple. It basically says that these mesenchymal stem cells can differentiate either into white adipocytes that store energy or into beige adipocytes that burn energy and that the shift between the two is controlled by this one nucleotide variant which actually leads to a seven pound difference in weight between risk and non-risk individuals, not because of a change in uh, brain expression or because of a change in appetite or exercise, but because of a change specifically in the adipocytes of these individuals. And there's a very large number of genetic variants that are yet to be discovered, and those methods are in fact very general and should allow us to now start dissecting a large number of variants associated with uh, a diversity of disorders. I'm going to very briefly mention our work on uh, using epigenomics to reveal weak but functional variants, and this is um, basically looking at the sub-threshold variants that are associated with disease but have very small effects. And our work in uh, a large number of traits indicates that there's a large fraction of uh, missing and hidden heritability across different individuals. And there's been a growing understanding of our field uh, that, in fact, even within our uh, genotyping arrays, 
there's a large number of variants that remain hidden that are sitting in these uh, sub-threshold uh, locus. So what we did is uh, first ask how far down the rank list do these genetic enrichments persist for these trait-relevant uh, enhancers? And they persist very, very far down the rank list, suggesting that there's a large number of variants. And we focus specifically on, um, two, um, on, on cardiac traits to basically try to elucidate the function of these variants. So we looked at the sub-threshold variants between 10 to the minus 8 and 10 to the minus 5, and we found that there's a large number of epigenomic signatures that allow us to now start prioritizing them systematically by training on the genome-wide significant hit and then applying it to predict sub-threshold variants. We have, in fact, gone off and validated a large number of these variants, showing that in, 11, in, in 9 of 11 tested cases, we do find allelic activity, and in some cases, we're able to now go and show specifically in zebrafish embryos that by altering these uh, genes that are targeted by these subthreshold variants, we actually can lead to a change in the heart repolarization duration. In order to discover that association, we would have needed three times as many individuals as what we had now, but uh, by actually using epigenomic information, we're able to um, uh, elucidate those with only a third of the individuals, uh, indicating the power and importance of epigenomic information for prioritizing these subthreshold variants. The last thing we looked at is somatic mutations that are uh, associated with cancer gene dysregulation. So the model there is that a large number of dispersed mutations would in fact be found in the regulatory neighborhood of cancer genes, but all target the same gene and lead to its dysregulation. So in order to understand that, we basically uh, searched for cancer tumor pairs that were dysregulated, and we identified that nearly five times as many genes are upregulated in cancer versus downregulated in cancer, indicating uh, that derepression might be a common mechanism of action. And indeed, the genes that show derepression are in fact very strongly enriched for a large number of these known coding variants in their regulatory neighborhood. And those variants are primarily sitting in enhancer regions, which are active in other tissues and cell types, rather than specifically in the cancer in which these variants appear to be acting. And the, region is again, the reason is, again, a derepression model for cancer, where regulatory elements are now utilized out of context, similar to the uh, change that we saw in the FTO variant. So we built a model that allows us to now estimate from the genome by genome sampling what the expected mutation rate should be for each of the genes based on the regulatory neighborhood, and then use these expectations to now calculate an enrichment for each of those uh, genes that allows us to now predict new cancer genes based on the enrichment of their uh, regulatory plexus. And you can see here that these plexi can be extremely complex or extremely simple, but um, in both cases, we find a large number of new genes that are associated with cancer that are in fact falling in a small number of pathways that are already known to play roles in cancer. So to summarize, we basically looked at a systematic characterization of the epigenomic landscape that we can then utilize to mechanistically dissect disease-associated loci using these public data sets generated by the Roadmap Epigenomics Project and the ENCODE Project, and uh, systematic experimentation in uh, relevant cell types. We also saw briefly how we can, in fact, utilize these epigenomics to understand weakly associated uh, regions that are functional, even though they do not meet genome-wide significance threshold, and to understand somatic alterations that are associated with cancer. The first part, uh, the first application was uh, in collaboration with Melina Klausmitzer, uh, who's um, a professor at Harvard and has been spending a postdoc in my lab as well. And the second uh, part was uh, in, uh, worked by Sinchen Wang in collaboration with Lori Boyer in the MIT Biology Department. And the last part is led by uh, Richard Salari, uh, who's a postdoc in my group.
And uh, this is all in the context of the Roadmap Epigenomics Project, which is funded by NIH, and uh, we're also funded partially by the NHGRI. So I'll stop there, go back to my outline slide, and I'll be very happy to take any questions. Well, thank you, Dr. Kellis, for that very informative presentation. Before we get started on the Q&A session, I'd like to remind our audience that you can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking the green Q&A button to the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. Well, if there are no, if there are no questions, I'd like to take this opportunity to once again thank Dr. Kellis, and I'd like to also uh, remind everyone that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing for six months from today's live event. You will receive an email from LabRoots alerting you that this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Uh, we'll wait just one minute for a few more questions. If, uh, if, uh, if anybody wants to send some, we have a few minutes left. I want to also thank you all for listening. And uh, my email is manoli at mit.edu. I'll be very happy to, to take any questions by email as well. And um, I guess this talk will be available. So feel free to reach out to myself or any members of my lab to answer any questions. Great. Well, thank you all for joining us today. And Thank we'll you see guys. See you next time. Bye. Bye.